Uh, hi, I'm Sarah. I've just started over at Dicebreaker and I'm very pleased to join the team. <laughs> uh, now let's see what terrible things this bucket holds for me. Why did you join Dicebreaker? Oh God, where do you even start with that? Um, so I started out kind of as a games journalist and I wrote in for a lot of like games publications, often covering quite esoteric and strange topics, uh, like things like DOS games and also like how wargaming might like kind of change the government in a very vague way. I'm not gonna go into that right now. But the main reason that I joined Dicebreaker um, is because I think that there's a real dearth of good tabletop journalism. There's a couple of really great magazines. Uh, I've done, done some stuff with tabletop gaming. Um, and I absolutely, I found that I just absolutely loved writing about board games. Um, and a couple of years ago, I also really got into Dungeons and Dragons. And it was kind of like, the more Dungeons and Dragons I played, the more I wanted to play tabletop games overall. It really became like a bit of an addiction, you know? Uh, so the reason that I joined Dicebreaker is because it's an opportunity to write about board games and tabletop RPGs. Uh, tabletop RPGs in particular, I think that independent tabletop RPGs don't get a lot of coverage. And that's something that I'm really interested in looking into further, just because there's so many talented designers out there. And just to say for the record, I adore Dungeons and Dragons. It's like my favorite thing in the world. But, you know, I think that like there are also loads of other things which are just so fascinating. You know, like, for example, Dread, which, uh, you know, you guys streamed not so long ago. So uh, that's another reason I joined Dicebreaker. Um, I've worked with the Gamer Network before who run Dicebreaker and I know that they, they create excellent publications with really talented people and so I'm really excited to kind of be here doing my thing but also just learning from the team. If you and your friend were stuck on a desert island, what three games would you bring? God, that's a, that's a tough one because you not only want games that are like really fun, but you want games that you could effectively just replay, <laughs> like ad infinitum. Uh, so I would probably take something like uh, Magic, Magic the Gathering, uh, bring in a couple of few decks because I think that Magic has a lot of variety in gameplay. Um, I take in something like Quacks uh, to help us vent out a bit of frustration and stop us like killing and eating each other because it's quite competitive and it's got that kind of thrilling gambling element which can just help you, you know, like shut out the horrors of the world. And third game. You see, I want to say Mansions of Madness, but for the second edition, you really need a TV for that stuff. <laughs> um, so. Third game would probably be, if I'm totally honest, like just pen and paper and just kind of getting down and playing some strange RPGs. You need minimum components and all you need is another person, so you're good to go. If you were a board game, <laughs> what kind of board game would you be? God, um, I mean, I think that, I mean, I don't know if you can tell, but I kind of like my, my dark and spooky stuff. Um, I think that I would probably be a board game that had like a lot of emphasis on theme and narrative because that's what I'm really drawn to. And I think it would probably be a board game that had like some sort of horrifying deception element in it um, because that's something that I really enjoy. And I quite, if I'm totally honest, I quite like kind of like being the bad guy <laughs> in the board game. I'd like to see like more board games where you're not like, we are the heroes that have come to save the land and more like, we've just come here to like destroy everything. Yes. Uh, oh, favorite type of die. Okay, so I've got to, I've got to answer this question in two parts. First, first part is as a player, D20, it's traditional, it's clean, it's beautiful. I've had so many good times with the D20. It basically just feels like some kind of like old lover that I'm fond of now. Uh, and as a DM, when I'm, when, I, when, I'm when I'm a dungeon master, I really like the percentile dice because whenever you roll a percentile, it basically means that like some very crazy stuff is about to go down. Uh, so for example, you roll the percentile dice when you're, pl uh, when you're playing like a wild sorcerer to determine which of the horrifying or possibly completely ineffective like uh, random magics will occur. Or um, I really like the sound of the percentile dice when you're rolling for treasure and it determines like whether you're gonna get like something super awesome or I don't know, just like a horrifying mime that kills you all. So that's really fun. I enjoy the chaotic aspect of the percentile dice or the D100. <laughs> if you could design one board game, what would it be about? Ah, <sighs> that's a really, that's like a really tough one. Like. I think that there are so many topics in board gaming and so many themes that are kind of just waiting to be explored. So, you know, you can see that in something like Fog of Love, which is a game that I've recently played and really enjoyed, um, which covers very human themes of relationships. So I think that I would be like really interested in designing a game that just covered a theme that was perhaps like just not seen very much. Um, and also a board game that really emphasized good writing and kind of good characterization. 
um, but ultimately also just kind of made you think about those themes. So, I mean, God, there's like 110 things <laughs> that I could talk about as like themes not like covered in board games. Um, but yeah, some, something like that, something more human, uh, because that makes me quite curious. Ameritrash or Eurogame? Well, I mean, that's pretty easy. Uh, I love Dungeons and Dragons. I love playing make-believe. I'm all about the theater of the mind. So uh, I'm Ameritrash through and through. Theme, atmosphere, that, that's what it's all about for me. What tabletop related item is most effective as an implement of murder? Okay, excellent. So again, I'm gonna do this as a two part question as I've probably thought about this more than the average person. Um, I would say D4s immediately because they are so sharp and pointy and basically just D4 straight to the eye. I think you'd be sorted just throwing them in there. Uh, secondly, potentially if you used a board game from Kickstarter, like one of, one of those ones that has like nine boxes and you just, you, you could probably just beat someone to death with it and then bury them under the boxes and no one would ever know. Board games or card games? Ah, that's a tough one, because there's quite a lot of card games I've been playing recently. Like I've been really getting into kind of deck building as a thing. Um, but for the moment, it's got to be board games just because it has that like wonderful kind of fetishized aspect where you open up the box and you're like, hey, I'm kind of an adult, but oh my God, it's a toy. So board games. <laughs> What's your favorite party game? Ah, oh, that is a tough one because there are so many great party games out there. Um, for the moment, I'd probably say I, I quite enjoy Mysterium. Like it, it's quite a small like party game, um, but I think it really emphasizes kind of like being cooperative, which I really like about it. And um, I've been to a few board game nights where Mysterium has been used as kind of the opener and it's allowed you to kind of get to know all these strangers and kind of plot together and look at strange abstract cards and try and work out stuff. So I really enjoy Mysterium because in a kind of in its own strange spooky way, it kind of brings people together. If you died, what board game would they play at your funeral? God, I mean, so I think it would have to be something like fairly simple and low input. Um, and most of my friends and family know that I'm quite into spooky stuff. And the game that I'd say I've played en masse with most of my friends the most is Betrayal at House on the Hill. So I quite like the idea of like people playing Betrayal and then like, you know, just murdering the traitor at the end or the traitor murdering them. You know, I feel like, you know, death is definitely a theme at a funeral and Betrayal at House on the Hill has so much death. So definitely that because it's thematically on brand. Which celebrity would you most like to play an RPG with? So I'm not sure if like this person counts as a celebrity in terms of like, hey, I'm celebrated and all of that. But I think I would really like to play an RPG with someone like Galimio del Toro, someone who's tremendously imaginative, someone who kind of has a lot of fun. I think he'd be quite fun to play board games with. So yeah, essentially any like any kind of like auteurs, any kind of visionary, I'd, I'd just be so fascinated to see what they'd be like in a kind of collaborative improv sort of game. What is... <laughs> <laughs> what is the most edible board game component? I mean, it depends what you count as food. I, I imagine anything made of paper would probably not kill you too quickly. Um, <laughs> you know what? I often, I've sometimes seen like little, little, like tiny cute meeples and gems and things that are just so adorable. You kind of just want to eat them because they're so lovely and they remind you of like happy candy lands and rainbows. So I would basically say anything that's kind of cute and colorful, um, I will struggle to basically not want to put into my mouth. <laughs> so yes, that is my answer there. What excites you about Dicebreaker? Uh, so many things. Um, I'm really excited to be working with such a talented team. Um, I'm really excited that we're starting, starting new and moving into this space, which is just rapidly growing. Um, I'm really excited to kind of like evangelize and share the games that I find really interesting. I'm really excited to uh, get talking to more game designers and artists and just kind of learning like where their ideas come from and how these things are made. And I'm so excited as well to, I suppose this is gonna sound like really pretentious, but like, I guess just kind of be able to explore like board games and where they lie in overarching culture. Um, Cause something that I've, I've realized sort of writing about board games the last few months for um, some other publications is that because it's so new as, as a kind of medium that's becoming popular, it's like there's so much space to just explore like how things are made, what they mean, what their influences are. Um, and, you know, also I'm really looking forward to just, you know, writing about Dungeons and Dragons and hopefully uh, doing lots and lots of stupid voices <laughs> with, with people that I like. Uh, so there are many, many things. Basically, to summarize, I am excited about Dicebreaker and it's great to be here.
<laughs> Bonk, marry or kill? I mean, I've got to be honest, I was not expecting a question like this in this context. So, do I want to bonk, marry or kill Dungeons and Dragons, Mansions of Madness or Quarks of Windelberg? Well, I would probably marry Dungeons and Dragons because we are now essentially enmeshed in a codependent relationship and I couldn't imagine life without them. So basically, you know, D&D's put the ring on my finger. I'm straight in there. That's where I'm staying. It's my forever home now. Although I adore Mansion of Madness and love playing it because it's so grim and so eldritch and I absolutely love all of those things. Um, you know, I played a game one time where like just everyone went insane and you know, it was just a combination of who had gone insane and who had gone murderously insane. So I would probably kill Mansion of Madness because as much as I love it, I don't think that I would want to live in a world that was determined by Mansions of Madness because it would be terrifying and full of unknowable horror. Um, and then I would probably bonk Quax because Quax is super fun, it's super lurid, it's kind of like instantly engaging. You know what, I'd probably like bonk Quax like quite a few times and it would always just be like this kind of casual super fun thing. You know, don't really have to see it again, it's all good. But yeah, I enjoy Quax because it's very fun, it's push your luck and it's very engaging. So uh, yes, those are the decisions that I would make. <laughs> what game are you sick to death of playing? Uh, you see, that's like, that's kind of a tough one because I've, if I don't like a game too much, that's kind of around the time that I stopped playing it. Um, I'd probably say that I think that Werewolf, although it's a lot of fun, is a little bit overused. Um, and I've kind of, I've sort of played it quite a few times in like party settings. And it's not that it's bad, it's more that it's just become like the de facto social deduction game that you play at parties. Um, so I'd say Werewolf, not because it's bad, but just because it's like, hey, let's try some other social deduction games. There are so many. So that's my answer. Name four game designers. Ah, well, there are many to choose from here. So I really enjoy uh, the, the, the hilarious kind of antics of Grant Howitt and his one page RPGs. Uh, I also, you know, respect and idolise Chris Perkins, who uh, designed Curse of Strahd, which is a horrifying Dungeons & Dragons campaign that I've been playing for the last two years. We, we really got into it. Um, I would say David Tursey, because he's a lovely chap who has one of those brains that is just so alien to me because it's incredibly mathematical and strategic. And there's kind of like an element to designers like that where it's just like, I'm just in awe of what, what's happening up there and what they're making with it. Um, and I would say Bruce Glasgow, the original designer of Betrayal of Hill House. Obviously, Rob Dave, who came in uh, kind of with a legacy adaption. Um, but yeah, I really like how a lot of like the influences of Betrayal and Hill House are essentially just drawn from kind of like 50s horror movies. And I think that's a very cool influence. So anyone that's kind of pushing horror in games, that's my person. What's your favorite place to play games? Oh, I mean, that that's simple because I am basically a hermit. So I love playing games at home because my cat is there to wreck all the pieces when required or just sort of lay upon things. Um, but I really like being at home. I like being at home with my friends. Like board games for me are just a very social kind of homely experience. Um, that said though, you know, lucky I live in Brighton. There are lots of amazing places to play games here and I do do that. I do go out sometimes, I promise. Uh, but ultimately, like, home is where the heart is, home is where the games are. So that's the place for me to play games. Tiny or massive games? <sighs> that's kind of a tough one because I feel that if something is massive just for the sake of being massive, like, it's kind of a bit pointless. <laughs> um, at the same time, I, I think that some tiny games are very cleverly designed and I respect that design. But then sometimes you get a tiny game and you open it and it's just like, you're just sags. You're like, what, what's in here? There's nothing here. So I would probably say that I like massive games on the basis that they usually have more goodies inside them, things to pour at, etc. Last question. Oh, what's the weirdest thing one of your RPG characters has ever done? Okay, right, I'm gonna have to like think about this. <laughs> there are a lot of, a lot of weird things. Um, a lot of weird things. Uh, quite recently in Curse of Strahd, we came across 
a creature called uh, the Rock, which is literally a monstrous bird that's like about 120 foot, like 120 foot wide. Literally, like the Earth was shuddering as it like flew past. Um, our wizard Alatar, who is a very very smart boy, decided that the best way to deal with the monstrosity was to turn it into a turtle. So as the rock descended on us, Alatar, this very like weedy wizard, strides up to it, and as it's coming, touches it once with polymorph, and it immediately becomes a tiny turtle, and it crashes down, and he catches it, <laughs> and then ironically, he, he, he's trying to throw it off of the cliff, although he's become quite attached to it because it's now an adorable turtle, and the turtle turtle nearly killed the party tank because it kept biting at him as he tried to, as he tried to throw it and basically like if if the turtle had landed it would have turned back into the rock again so we uh yeah probably that was probably one of the weirdest things was we were like preparing ourselves for this horrifying fight with this monstrosity and then the wizard's just like nah you're a turtle now we grab it we throw it off the cliff all done <laughs> um another pretty like weird thing that we did was we were in this temple this one time and essentially all of, all of our souls got kind of kidnapped by this entity within the temple, this dark god that literally like dragged us all into separate rooms trying to make awful, awful deals with us. Like, to give you an idea of like how creepy some of these gods are, one was called the Smiling God and uh, the other one was known as the, uh, the Laughing Shadow. Um, and because my character in, in, in this campaign is a little bit weird and a little bit mystical and this one time rolled natural 20 on a religion check, I know how to travel between the astral plane. So I was tasked with getting all of the other characters out of these horrifying deals that they are about to make with these entities. And the bitter irony of it is, is that one character, even after I took him out, still made the deal to become like a death knight and is now undead, <laughs> but also has like wings and like finger of death. So, um, you know, so the rest of the party are like, maybe I sh we should have made those deals. I'm like, no, they all had downsides, terrible, terrible downsides. So that was very strange because I was going into the astral plane and because our dungeon master is absolutely fantastic, each of the gods were kind of preying on a fear that that character had had. So as the bard, I had to kind of basically just use my high charisma to try and drag people back. Because um, obviously while they're in this plane, their bodies are decaying in the real world. So there was this real, uh, so yeah, really, really that's a shout out to, my, to, to our DM for just being absolutely like bloody fantastic. <laughs> So, thank you so much for listening to me rant inanely about the nerdy things that I love. And uh, basically, I'm, I'm a writer. We are currently creating all of the delicious content that you will be requiring for the upcoming Dicebreaker site. Uh, please feel free to check out the beautiful videos which all of my colleagues have made. I'm gesturing here to a liminal space which will be filled with your wildest dreams. And uh, yeah, also please subscribe and feel free to click that, that bell button again in the wild space of all of your wildest dreams, uh, which will allow to help give you notifications about when we create beautiful, beautiful hashtag content for your eyes. Thank you so much again. So excited to be here. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.